What do you call a guy who's impervious to bullets? Who took the war on drugs right to G.I. Joe? You call him bulletproof. Let's talk about him. First, thanks for watching JLS Comics. If you do like the video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe because I do upload videos just like this every single week. All right, let's jump into our story. Earl Morris was born in Chicago, Illinois. At one point while growing up, Earl decided to join the law enforcement community. But which agency? He decided he wanted to apply to the oldest, the first, federal law enforcement agency in the United States, a storied agency founded with 1789's Judiciary Act by George Washington himself. He decided to join the U.S. Marshal Service. With his choice made, Earl then had to go through a rigorous three-week basic training program at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia, on the site of the old Naval Air Station Glencoe. Glencoe has an interesting history because it was originally built to house K-class blimps an entire airship squadron during World War II as the sentry of the shipping lanes, a convoy escort, along with duties like ASW maritime patrols, where they were looking out for U-boats in the littoral waters off the coast of America. Let's get back to Bulletproof. As a marshal, Earl was most likely conducting TAC ops, prisoner transport, and conducting high-risk fugitive operations and witness security for those that chose to inform on their co-conspirators. This would have undoubtedly put him in direct contact with the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, whom, through interagency cooperation, they would have done fieldwork together. This fieldwork piqued Earl's interest, and he decided he wanted to work on the other side of apprehension and indictments. He wanted to work on interdiction efforts and tracking down dealers and smugglers, so he decided to join the DEA. And since one of DEA's requirements is infield criminal justice experience, Earl's transfer was simple. So he then went to Quantico, Virginia for more training at a facility that, before clandestine lab was constructed, was shared with the FBI right on the Marines base in Quantico. Earl then became a field officer, working counter-narcotics like on cocaine operations in Central America with Operation Snowcap and the arrest of Manuel Noriega at the end of Operation Just Cause. Operation Just Cause was the first time that a new helicopter was flown for combat operations, and that was the AH-64A Apache. It's worth noting that Bulletproof's file card says he's a pilot for the AH-74 Desert Apache attack helicopter, released as part of the Sonic Fighters line. So we can assume he wasn't just handed the keys and told good luck up there, which means he most likely flew with DEA, meaning he's at least a GS-11 and a special agent, which also means prior to Apache's introduction, he was flying Loaches, A-Stars, Blackhawks, and Kiowas as part of their 100-plus fixed-wing and rotary craft fleet. He had to have spent two years in field operations before becoming a pilot with the DEA Air Wing. Morris also conducted heroin and opiate ops in the Golden Triangle of Southeast Asia and the Caribbean along with partner agencies like Coast Guard, CBP, and the Justice Department as part of the Southern Detachment of the Joint Interagency Task Force intercepting fast boats, yachts, cargo, container ships, which were attempting to smuggle drugs into the U.S. It makes him very adept at VBSS which means he knows his way around various firearms and skills like fast roping and CQB. Major Morris had great luck in the field, and after many firefights against an onslaught of Desert Eagles, AK-47s, Contra Affair era CIA-supplied weapons, and Uzi-wielding thugs in the private armies of drug kingpins around the world, in countless raids and firefights, he was never hit, which earned him the name Bulletproof. But it wasn't his unit that named him. It was the people trying to shoot him that could never land a hit. As his file card says, they exclaimed, he must be bulletproof. Since we're talking names, I'm going to go on a limb here. Where did Haman Hasbro come up with the name Earl Morris? There was a famous archaeologist around the turn of last century named Earl Morris who spent a lot of time in Chichen Itza, the same region that Bulletproof covered with DEA. Archaeologist Earl Morris, many believe, was one of the inspirations to George Lucas when creating Indiana Jones. Marvel Comics, who also published G.I. Joe, began publishing The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones, which would follow the adventures of Indy. Later in that series, issues were written by Linda Grant, who then went on to become an editor on Hama's A Real American Hero series. And Hama also co-wrote The Devil's Handshake about Alaric Mobius and Basil Fox, which are a couple of analogs to people like Indiana Jones and Alan Quartermain, so he definitely had an interest in that field. This is when Bulletproof found his way to the G.I. Joe team who were seeking to expand their roster and their terrorism operations into drug elimination, no doubt spurred on by Nancy Reagan and her Just Say No political campaign. Bulletproof was accepted into the G.I. Joes and was quickly assigned as the head of the G.I. Joes DEF leading Mutt, Junkyard, Shockwave, and Cutter. He's also later noted as being in charge of the Joes urban law enforcement operations, which puts both DEF and SWAT under his command. 
Bulletproof debuted in Larry Hama and Marvel Comics, a real American hero comic book series with issue 124 in the spring of 1992. The issue opens up with Bulletproof wasting no time taking charge of DEF. The team was on Broca Beach about to make entry into a drug lab. Bulletproof had Shockwave as door kicker with Cutter breaking right, Mutt covering left through the fatal funnel, and Junkyard taking up the drag position. The building was the lair of an Errol Flynn looking drug dealer named Headman and his crew of drug dealing henchmen called the Headhunters. Headman set up shop in the beachside Cobra controlled town of Broca Beach for business, but not even Cobra wanted them there. Cobra Commander wanted him out, plot point we'll get to in a minute, and he didn't want Headman poisoning his Legion of Cobra troops with his poison. Headman also had a CG to contend with. So Shockwave breached and Bulletproof yelled freeze. This is a combined federal law enforcement and military operation as they saw Headman and his spiky shoulder padded headhunters inside with their scale and paraphernalia. He also introduced himself to the drug dealers and told Mutt to read them their rights. They were under arrest. Headman though wasn't having it. He took out a handgun and shot Bulletproof center mass, showing why he has the codename he does. Bulletproof wasn't down. He pulled open his shirt and revealed a grouping of four shots that had lodged themselves into the plating of his bulletproof vest. Headman and three of the foot soldiers quickly retreated to the boardwalk, shotguns and handguns ablaze. On the boardwalk, they ran into a lady who started shooting at them, angry that they got her son hooked and that they had killed her husband. So Headman shot the lady, piercing her lung. The EF was still in pursuit, and when they found her on the sidewalk, Bulletproof and Cutter stayed with her while Shockwave and Mutt continued after the dealers. It turns out that it was this lady who had called in the tip to Bulletproof and the team in an attempt to try to save her son. Her husband was a Fred CG, and so was her son, although the son went by the name Freebase Freddy. She was about to tell them that the town was controlled by Cobra, but she died before she could. Cutter, though, saw the markings on her weapon and realized it was from the arsenal at Cobra Island. Freebase Freddy was there and collapsed to his knees, crying. Bulletproof promised Freddy that they'd get the slime that killed his mother. Bulletproof and Cutter then ran into two guys named Mike and Ike. Bulletproof ordered them to drop their weapons, but they told them that they were on their side, so they all teamed up together, and the four of them attacked the carnival ride where Headman and his headhunters had shockwave mutt and junkyards surrounded. Mike and Ike, though, were quickly gunned down as the two Joes pressed forward. They were able to take down the headhunters and then surround Headman himself, with Bulletproof again telling Mutt to read him his Miranda rights. It turns out they had him surrounded above a trapdoor, and Headman dropped down the hatch into a maze of tunnels under the floor, escaping custody once again. Bulletproof and the team continued investigating Headman and his operations for weeks after he escaped. They got intel that Headman was getting shipments in New York City and then shipping them down to the Jersey Shore. At the onset of their final interdiction operation, Duke called in to divert the team for another assignment. Cobra Commander had set up with Flak Vipers and Paralyzer tanks at a telephone switching facility in the Jersey marshlands. And from there, Cobra had tapped into a secure landline that connected the Pentagon with General Colton and his Chrysler Building-based SDI laser. Colton had installed a tracer program that traced a fluctuation, which was Cobra's signal tap, back to the station that Cobra had taken over. So that's why Duke diverted DEF. It was national security. Meanwhile, Headman was parked offshore on a shipping vessel. Headman was bragging that he'd borrowed money from the mob to bankroll this large purchase, and that Baroka Beach was a perfect place to run ashore because Cobra themselves were set up in town and narking would incriminate themselves, so they really couldn't do it. Wild Bill had took Colton, Duke, and Stalker to the switching station in a tomahawk, but it turns out that it was all an ambush. They'd sent the signal through the phone line on purpose, trying to draw the Joes out of the building, away from the SDI laser. And so Wild Bill's helicopter was hit by a tank, so he belly flopped it down onto a paralyzer. They were stranded, and Cobra and his troops took a trio of rats up the coast right to the SDI laser installation. So Bulletproof and DEF showed up at the Marshland station to get the stranded Joes, and Bulletproof was yelling at Duke, We got pulled off our freighter intercept for a red herring? A mission and weeks of planning was gone, seemingly for nothing. Bulletproof's DEF boat had some battle copters and crates, so they quickly assembled them, and the Joes flew back to the city while Bulletproof and Cutter headed back to their first mission in their fast boat. Meanwhile, Cobra had broken into the laser installation and used the laser to destroy Headman's freighter. That's all they wanted to do. As the Joes arrived, Cobra just left in the gliders. Out on the water at their freighter wreckage, Bulletproof pulled Headman out of the water while Cutter pulled in a couple headhunters. They were all under arrest. Mission accomplished. After the battle with Headman, Bulletproof went back to full-time work with DEA and remained on reserve status with the Joes. Should the need arise, he could be called up at any time. And during the Devil's Due period in a book called America's Elite, this exact thing happened. He was pulled from DEA and fought in World War III in Spain. 
And due to the timing of his release, Bulletproof's debut on the animated side came with the Deke series that followed the Sunbow series. There he was voiced by William Taylor, who also voiced characters like Heavy Duty and Static Line. Bulletproof made his debut in the second part of a two-parter called Long Live Rock and Roll, where he's seen flying a battlecopter. And his big turn came in, in an episode called The Greatest Evil. Headband Gristle and the Headhunters were selling a new product called Spark, and Cindy, the sister of a Crimson Guard immortal, along with Falcon, had gotten hooked on it. Bulletproof had to talk some sense into Duke after Duke dressed down his brother and disowned him for being an addict. Falcon was checked into the same hospital where Cindy was recovering from an overdose, and so Bulletproof said to Duke that he should go visit Falcon in the hospital. Bulletproof told the Joes that their war on drugs was a war on the greatest evil. The Joes teamed up with Cobra for their new war and Bulletproof was paired with Metalhead. We get to see him attacking Headman and even at one point driving a battle wagon. At the end, Headman overdosed on his own product and died. He also appeared in the end of the series in The Legend of Metalhead, but these were all flashbacks. On the action figure side, Bulletproof's V1 action figure was released in 1992 where he was, appropriately, part of the Drug Elimination Force subteam. A prototype Bulletproof, however, is the figure you can find in the TV commercials and catalogs where his camo is different as is his missile launcher, however his GP-88 field rifle is still his issued weapon at production. His second figure was released the following year as part of the Battlecore line. He too was intended to be part of DEF, but as that line was cancelled, he joined Battlecore as their urban leader. That said, V2 Bulletproof was released in Australia, still with the DEF packaging. In 2018, the G.I. Joe Collectors Club released a third figure, still noted as Battlecore Commander, in addition to being Urban Operations Commander. In Brazil, for the Commando's MN Sao line, Bulletproof's mold was used to make a figure named Tiro Certo, which translates to Certain Shot, an interesting opposite name to Bulletproof. There was a Bulletproof as part of Cops, however this was not Earl Morris. That Bulletproof was an FBI agent named Baldwin P. Vest. A play on words, a play on Bulletproof Vest. Do you have one of these Bulletproof action figures in your collection? Let me know down in the comments below. And with that, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this each and every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.